Good evening, friends. It is uh, it again a very <laughs> great pleasure for me to meet all of you this evening for right another uh, edition of the IDS Prime Time. So you all know, and for the benefit of the new wish watchers, IDS Prime Time is a brand new program which has been happening over the last two months, where we have two components. One is to interview a pioneering legend who has dedicated his entire career for a development of a specialty or a development of a particular surgery. And we also get to hear to pioneers who have been working on a single procedure for their entire lifetime. It has been a rocking uh, yeah, happening uh, last week uh, with the great conglomeration of the IAGS and the RCS Edinburgh for having a phenomenal midterm virtual congress with more than 2,000 participants and 300 faculty. So I'm sure all of you would have cherished the moments staying with us. Now let us hear to two important preliminaries for this week. The first half of the session is going to be none other than the father of endocrine surgery and the man who created the field of surgical endocrinology in this part of the world, Professor S. Victor. Professor S. Victor is will be interviewed by uh, none other than our uh, honorary secretary, Dr. S. Kishwar Murthy, sir. Followed by, we have a very important person in the global arena, Professor David Watson. Professor David Watson has uh, done individually more than 4,000 anti-reflex operations. And uh, he is going to be reminiscing with uh, our president-elect, Professor D. Sunil Papa. So, ladies and gentlemen, I present Professor S. Vittal along with Dr. S. Ishwar Murthy. Over to you, Nathan. Friends, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to IAGS Prime Time. Eight decades ago, there's a little town called Trivellur near Chennai, born a surgeon who, with the sheer determination and hard work, became an integral part of history of surgery in India. A pious, iconic surgeon with wit and wisdom in his speech and precision execution in every action, he has made a lasting impact in whatever he did and wherever he went. He is a fatherly figure for all of us, and he is the father of endocrine surgery in India. Yes, this is our one and only Professor Dr. Sri Padam Bittal from Chennai, whose story I am sure will be a great inspiration for all the young budding surgeons. Please come with me. Let us go to his house to meet him and greet him. Hello, sir. Yeah. yeah. A nice uh, meeting you, sir. This is from IAGS office. As a secretary, I'm very, very glad to meet you today. And uh, today you are going to be in the IAGS prime time, uh, wherein uh, people across the country or even various parts of the world are waiting for us to show the living legend. So nice meeting you after some time. And uh, I wanted you to remember your those days when you had uh, your undergraduation, post-graduation, and as a passionate teacher and assistant walking in the corridor of Madras Medical College alongside Professor Sarat Chandra, those days of your undergraduation, post-graduation, sir. Uh, thank you, Dr. Isramuthi, for uh, inviting me to be in the midst of uh, uh, EAG's prime time, which, for which I'm very much honored, in fact. My mother's father, is a very famous doctor those days, Dr. G. Narayan Sam Madaliar, and he's a contemporary of Dr. M. R. Gursam Madaliar, Colonel Pandalai, and other things. My mother always used to talk very high about the father. Father did that, father did that as a doctor, he did that, he did that. So, in my growing period itself, I felt that the doctor profession is something which you can do something good for the people and that is how I got interested 
to become a doctor and that's how I entered into medicine. And those days there are only three medical colleges. A, it will be Madras Medical College, Stanley Medical College, Madurai Medical College, only three. And about 300 students only will be taken. So we had a very cohesive relationship in uh, the Madras Medical College student of uh, working under a great doyen of yesteryears, Professor M.M. Cooper. M.M. Yes, uh, Cooper is a very great uh, anatomist. And I started developing interest in anatomy. I started reading lots of anatomy. And those days, and uh, I used to like anatomy because of uh, Cooper. After I entered into my postgraduate, uh, this one, uh, I was with the Professor G. Atmaram Rao, an army return surgeon who came from Vizag and joined the Madras Medical College, along with uh, Padma Shri, Professor Sadashivam, they are all there, Colonel Shepherd, they are all there. They came and joined. I was with uh, Atmaram Rao, who is known for his punctuality, time, and a very neat person. I was very fortunate to be with Atma Ramarao. And uh, he taught me how to behave with the patient. He is very particular. If you go and examine a patient without even putting a towel, you had it. Simply you had it. The decency of examining a patient Bedside uh, manners. All manners yeah. People yeah. say in UK it is a very important aspect in your yeah, assessment yeah. also. Yeah. I think you learned it here itself in here India. Itself, from, you were blessed with the good the mentors and the Men teachers. Very many days. mentors. I mean, I'm sure uh, I, uh, because I was told and also I heard the, uh, I mean, fortunate enough, I was listening to your uh, mentors, Professor Sarat Chandra, I am ah. sure, uh, along with him. This is a very important occasion I could see. Correct. Could you just uh, recollect uh, this uh, important uh, occasion and about this uh, genius whom you had the fortunate to, uh, I mean, work with and you, and uh, please tell us uh, about him, sir. This is Professor Sarat Chandra standing there and the person who is lighting is the Dean of the Madras Medical College, Dr. V. Sivarajan and his RMO. And in between, I am standing. This is the beginning of the division of surgical endocrinology. And it was started like that. Professor Sarat Chandra and myself, yes, and of sir. course, with my colleagues, junior colleagues like Raja Sabhapati and others, uh, we have brought out a book on surgical endocrinology with invited contributions. Okay, and sir. that is the release of the book uh, that you are seeing that. And that is another an epoch making event as far as I'm concerned. It's a very, very important thing for me. Uh, nobody, I, as far as I'm concerned, that is my yes, view. Sir. I meant to see a person with abundance of knowledge. He will talk about uh, blood pressure. Suddenly, he'll say, do you know what is law of Laplace? He'll talk to physics. And yes. something like that. He's a walking, and we call him a walking encyclopedia. And he's such a great teacher. And uh, second quality is unassuming. Once, I'll, uh, for the sake of uh, the, my juniors, I want to tell one incident with yes, Professor Sarachandra in the unit. One patient, uh, somebody, some postgraduate has operated GJ. Those days they used to do GJ with vagotomy. Yeah. And uh, it started oozing. And the nurse called for the DA. DA was not available. I was busy elsewhere. So she rang up Dr. Sarachandra. Dr. Sarachandra came immediately at 9.30 and he needed blood. So there wasn't anybody. So he went along with the nurse to get the blood, and he gave the blood and went home. Next day rounds, he was asking, how is this patient? The same postgraduate said, he's all right, sir. Any problem? No problem, sir, he said. And uh, we are all feeling very bad. Professor Sarachandra himself has come and given the blood, and this fellow, he says, no problem. Mm -hmm. He didn't say, don't lie, and nothing like that. Such a great personality. I am yet to see like a person like Professor Sarachandra is a very, very, very simple man. And he allowed me to teach night and day. And that is how I picked up his qualities. Because, you know, you go on with a person forever. 
and you pick it, pick it up. So that's a very Thank great you, personality. Can you tell me about this person, person in the war round along with you in MMC? I, I, I can never forget this personality. He's yes. again another person who helped me to go up on the ladders, particularly in Britain, is uh, jo uh, Professor John Fonden, the okay. professor of surgery at Bristol. Uh, whenever I go to Britain, I used to get down at London and go to Bristol to visit the Fonden, and he'll pick me up and be with him and drop me back. Uh, and whenever he crosses Chennai, he'll get down at Chennai airport and he will co come home, come and visit my ward and make ward rounds, teach the medical students and such a gentleman to the core. John Fonden, such a knowledgeable person, and he used to talk to me on the phone and he made me as one of the uh, members of the editorial board of British Journal of Surgery. So Very he nice. always say, you are, you are fit enough to become an editorial board of British Journal of Surgery. Only uh, last week with uh, Mike Griffin came uh, virtually and he was very happy the baby arranged the IAGS and the Indo-UK Sajikan is essentially a uh, exchange of knowledge between Royal College of Edinburgh. These are all possible because of people like you worked for several decades. Sir. Well, I think uh, I, I will say at the first instance I was not staying for too many years. About two and a half years I would have stayed there. That's all. Okay. So okay. what happened when I went in January or February, I got my primary. April, I got my final. And I joined Mr. Gibson at the Leeds General Infirmary. And then later on, I moved on to Wakefield, Pinderfields Hospital. And there I got very much close to Mr. Gibson. And he used to guide me, do this, do that, do like that, you know. And uh, so I became very close to the uh, Royal College. And he was a vice president of those years. So he used to induct me into some of the activities of the Royal College, which I liked very much. I liked the Royal College very much because of its uh, transparency, affection, and they showed on me. I was very, very much attached to Royal College those days itself. This one is uh, actually one of these uh, main uh, incidents I could, uh, I wanted you to share your happy moments. Overseas gold medal awarded in the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh in 2005, sir. Can you see this picture? Yeah, I, well, uh, that is another uh, memorable uh, thing for me. Uh, it is uh, one of the 2005, you said correctly, yeah. and quincentenary celebrations of the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh, and they gave for three people. And uh, I was very, very happy. How could uh, anybody be not happy in the world? They have chosen three people. And I am yes. one of them. And uh, the president uh, is giving me the medal. And uh, the Pr um, Pradeep Datta, yeah, is the honorary yes, secretary, uh, yeah, yeah. is looking up. And uh, it's a really a memorable, uh, this one, overseas gold medal. And I cherish that moment even today. And uh, this is another thing, the, very sir. recently in 2010, the English college invited yes, me uh, and awarded the Royal College of Surgeons uh, uh, Fellowship. Again, that is another thing. So, so many things happen between myself and the Royal Colleges. I think I need to get uh, some of your students uh, to say something about you and uh, and what they learned from you. And I am sure uh, there is an endless list of uh, your uh, postgraduate trainees and youngsters. And uh, one of them, obviously, is uh, Dr. Vijay Shankar. You know about Vijay Shankar, I am sure. Uh, he is at uh, Apollo now, uh, yeah. Professor of uh, Professor Sadasivam's son. I think Sadasivam was your teacher and now yeah. you are teaching Vijay Shankar. So he was so excited. And I'd ask him, why don't you just uh, say a few words, sir? Good evening, everybody. It's an honor and privilege to talk about a great institution called Professor Wittel, an acknowledged father of endocrine surgery in our country. As a single surgeon, he has done more than 15,000 endocrine surgeries, a number which many endocrine sectors in the world has not done till date.
a singular feat and accomplishment for a single surgeon. By his tireless efforts, surgical skills, and innovation, in the early 80s and 90s, he made sure that the rest of the Indian medical community take notice of his young, fledging endocrine surgery center in the Government General Hospital, Madras Medical College. As a result, many patients from different parts of our country flock to his center for good and sound surgery. Padma Shri Professor Vittal is a multifaceted person, a tough taskmaster, an endearing doctor to his patients, and an iconic medical teacher with a slice of British humor which he acquired during his stint in the United Kingdom. As years rolled by, his reputation spread throughout the country. He was soon a nationally recognized endocrine surgeon and a great medical statesman. It was not surprising that governments and head of the governments leaned on him for advice related to medical matters and the diseases of endocrine glands. Some of his words of wisdom were remarkably sharp, witty, and crisp. Silla time la bremikaveku, silla time la siripayu On one occasion, his young associate brought a few scissors and told him, this scissor is from Japan, please buy it. He, in his usual pragmatic, humorous way, told him, Doctor, I don't mind whether the cat is black or white, as long as it can catch the mice in my house. So give me a scissors which can cut when I want it to cut. Thus ended a conversation with a mild amount of wet. His advice to aspiring young medical doctor is three important words. Read, read, read. In medicine, knowledge is power, not money. Thank you. Your words after hearing this, uh, what do you want to share? I'm sure. Uh... Vijay Shankar uh, is the son of a uh, great surgeon, Padma Shri. Professor Sadaswam, naturally the genes have come yes. and uh, is, uh, now in Apollo is uh, one of the very noted cardiac surgeon, which I am very proud of. The, uh, the teacher is more happier than the taught. So in that way, I always uh, love Vijay Shankar because whenever he does a great surgery and cardiac cases, he'll tell me I've done that. Well, I am very happy. Vijay Shankar is going up like anything, and I wish him many more laurels. This is what this is what the teacher should do. Teacher should uh, act like a ladder, and uh, he must lift students to greater heights by showing his own behavior and his own uh, knowledge. His own this one. I always tell my patients or that my junior doctors when they're around. The three things that is important, one is availability of doctor. The next is the affability of a doctor. Third is the ability of doctor. Yes, so sir. when a patient comes to you, you must be available. When he sir, 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 means you must be available. Affability, you should not go and yell, what do you want? I say, no. What do you want? What do you want? Like that. Kind words. And last is your ability. How you operate in the theater. The patient is not going to come and see. So these are all the words that I tell my, like that I go on telling my youngsters and one such a great uh, soul. Now I'm happy to see Vijay Shankar talking so nicely in few words about. Thank you very Thank much. You, thanks. Thanks. And one similar person, I think he is also your undergraduate student, uh, Amarendra. He is now well settled in UK. It gives me great pleasure to say a few words about our dear Professor Bitter. I knew him for more than 45 years. I first met him when I started my surgical posting as a third year clinical student at Madras Medical College in the surgical ward at Government General Hospital. He's a kind person, he's a good teacher and a great mentor to his students and postgraduates, including myself. One can learn a lot about uh, surgical pathology, 
and the management plan even while observing in theater, not necessarily only in the wards. He can also pick up surgical skills, not necessarily while assisting, even as an observer in the theater. He keeps the mood alive and everybody likes his presence and feel at ease. I learned a lot from him and be in touch with him all through the years. What all I learned and the skills I observed and gathered came to a great help when I started my first overseas project in a remote hospital in Ghana in West Africa, where I was on my own to deal with every surgical emergency which came through the door. I must thank Professor Vittal for that and I pray Almighty to give him good health and great happiness all through for many, many years to come. Thank you. Dear Professor Vittal, have a nice evening with your friends. Thank you. When I had my birthday, he talked to me on the phone. Yeah, I was very happy to Amarendra has come up to uh, uh, accident and emergency consultant and uh, so much. And it's a wonderful personality. He is also hard working. Yeah. There is no substitute for hard working in surgery. You have taken the endocrinology as a super speciality now to yeah. the whole country, I think. Uh, and I, not only you established yourself, and I think everybody see you as a face of endocrine surgery in India, and uh, you brought the uh, super speciality and uh, various colleges across the country. You went and motivated all the people to take up. And uh, even in our state, people like Jodhi Ramalingam and, uh, uh, and all these uh, great personalities, I'm sure you, you can tell better than me. And your son and daughter, both Sai and Vishnupriya, they're all uh, all now doing a wonderful work in this field. Sir. And uh, I think the Indian Association of Endocrine Surgery, where you are the founder president from 1993 to 95, now Sai just now uh, has become the president and he did a marvelous job conducting their virtual conference. I think uh, these are uh, making you rightly chosen as you are the father of the endocrine surgery as a field in India. When I was a postgraduate, those days there is recent advances in surgery edited by Selvin Taylor. Yeah. He will always write about the thyroid and parathyroid. I used to read that, read that, read that, read that. And R.B. Welberm, who write all the time about the adrenal gland. So in my mind, I thought, uh, why not? We also can uh, go in that direction. Why should we uh, not uh, think about uh, specializing in that? Well, lots of people, lots of, you know, or there's, uh, many people will say, after all, there is nothing there. No, that is different. But I thought if you narrow down your speciality, you widen your skill is my axiom. Nobody can prevent a uh, general surgeon by definition, as far as I'm concerned, he can do anything. He can do the thoracotomy, he can do laparotomy, he can do colorectal. Anything can be done. You can't say colorectal should not be. No, no, they, they will do it. So that is how I view that. So let them do it. What, why not? Let them also do it. I'll also do it. Let me show that I will do it with little more perfection. That's all. I think you made it, I mean, uh, in the right time, because now if you see even the super speciality endocrine, now people only focus on thyroid, even in thyroid, they can focus on robotic thyroid, yeah. or they do, see, it is, expansion is so much, I think one cannot master of everything, you need to focus, yeah, that is the only way to get the excellence, the excellence right. is only by a focused, I mean, a concerted effort, I think you rightly uh, chosen the field, sir, and uh, you persevered, and uh, I think that's the reason, there are a lot of people, now out there, like you see, there are so many endocrine surgeons. They are very, very happy. Well, and well, uh, under well, your bunion tree, I think there are so many people here. Well, throughout to... India, lots of endocrine surgeons, and particularly yeah. at the beginning of MCH in Madras Medical College, MCH yeah. at the GPJ, MCH at the CMG. Lots of people are coming out as endocrine, and I'm very happy. Your uh, contribution in the Association of Surgeons of India, its growth. You worked as a counter secretary. 
for nearly four years and president of ASI 1998. The building we are seeing right here, I think it is with us in the ASI because of your uh, perseverance and hard work and understanding with the Professor Rangabhashyam, people like him. And I think you need to tell something about the, the ASI and its role because they rightly obviously chosen as the Lifetime Achievement Award for you in 2012. And we as a parent body, I mean the chapter of Tamil Nadu, we were very proud to appreciate all your thing and all you can see all these people you see how you can see uh, Professor Mohan Prasad and uh, Babu and uh, everybody is very happy to see you receiving this. Well I think the at some time ASA was in great trouble because of the heavy loans that they had taken to build the auditorium at that time only I was brought in as an honorary secretary very okay. tough time, really, <laughs> because uh, I had to manage a lot of things. By yeah. God's grace, I used to go and meet lots of people, bureaucrats, bank yes. officials, uh, politicians, everybody. And somehow I was able to get over the uh, loans and uh, turn the table towards the positive side. And that is how the ASA has started. Two more jewels uh, who came from your uh, I mean, training. One, of course, is uh, from Kaimathur, one of my close friends also, Professor Dr. Rajasa Sabhavadi, the consultant, plastic and hand surgeon in Ganga Hospital. This is what he has to say about you. Uh, and it's training. a privilege for me to speak about one of my mentors, uh, Professor uh, Winter. I think if you think back and think about your teachers or uh, how the world values uh, surgeons. I think primarily the, uh, the first criteria would be their skill levels. I think Professor Vittal was an extraordinarily skilled surgeon, be it uh, if any operator on thyroid or parotid or an uh, abdominal emergency. I think uh, his skill levels we found were extraordinarily good. And it's not that uh, flashy operating or uh, quick operating. And what really mattered uh, was outcomes. I think his, his uh, patients were outcomes are extraordinarily good. That's one. And secondly, he also taught us a lot of bedside manners as to how you deal with people, how you deal with uh, difficult attenders. I think everything. You know, so uh, what we got trained was a wholesome training that we got from. So which I am greatly indebted. The second point on which I would uh, greatly value my association with uh, Professor Vittal was, and when we were working as postgraduates, there's a time you know he started developing the surgical endocrinology division. It is only left for a few people to be pioneers and starting some uh, subspecialties in surgery. I think Dr. Vittal was in the right time, and then he did a great job in uh, starting the surgical endocrinology division. And uh, trials and the tribulations that he underwent it gave me a good idea as to if we could start up a microsurgery unit back in Coimbatore after our training. I think whenever we face trials and tribulations, I said, okay, you know, it's a norm. It's not that you know, that we are only suffering. I think everybody who has gone before us has suffered that. So for that, you know, I'm eternally grateful to Dr. Vittal for the opportunity he gave when he was setting up a unit. That's the second thing. The third thing that was uh, I would value him is uh, he served as an inspiration for the next generation. An inspiration in not only in uh, teaching and in surgical craft, but also in attire and how you present yourself. I think that's all, all are very important. I value that and I think they are very important. And they all know that uh, was a good state when we went abroad and when you went to so many other units. The one Dr. Vittal taught us was uh, extremely useful. And the um, second thing I would be very happy in this part is that uh, there will be a lot of good people, and you may be an assistant to them, you'll be working under them. That few people will be very happy, genuinely happy, allow you to grow. I think that's very important. I think that's a fantastic uh, trait to have. I think that's what now we all remember. And he was very happy that to grow because even when I was a uh, uh, post driver, he used to take evening classes. He used to tell me, No, you have to take class like this. Both him and Sarasada were extremely happy at the growth of their, uh, their uh, postgraduates, their students. And for that, you know, we are very, very uh, 
were ever grateful and that's a trait in which we also thought we should invite and allow others to grow under us. That's it. And uh, last but not the least, however good you may be, however powerful you may be, however contacts that you may have, I personally feel that uh, one of the greatest lessons he taught to me was that you need to be God fearing. You need to be accountable to somebody. I think you need to be accountable to somebody beyond you. I think you know, he was extremely God fearing. And we, we had to submit that we really used to submit ourselves to before the Almighty. And for that, again, you know, I'm very grateful. I remember him almost uh, uh, every day. And um, we, all the students uh, pray for his uh, continued um, uh, good health and hope he continues to inspire us. Thank you so much, Ishumati, for this great opportunity. Raja was very close to me those days also. He's a very brilliant man. And he got the BC Nash, Junior BC Award those days itself. Raja Sabapati is a really hardworking person. Today I'm very happy that he is in the helm of affairs in hand surgery and uh, managing a huge mammoth uh, hospital, Ganga Hospital. And I'm very happy when I see. Uh, well, I think the te again I am telling you, the teacher must be happy when I go to that Sai Sai Baba temple. I see that Ganga hospital. They said, "Okay, this is Raja is there." Good evening, Guru. In ancient Sanskrit, the word Guru has got two parts: Gu plus Ru. Gu means darkness. Ru is one who destroys that darkness, and that is what Professor. Shri, Dr. Vittal has been for most of us. I have been fortunate to have a 40 year learning experience with this gentleman. Every one of you knows about his awesome technical skills. We have all been mesmerized by his riveting lectures. But I am fortunate to have known him as a man, a gentleman, a mentor, and a philosopher. In these 40 years, what I have learned most importantly from Professor Vittal, and which I believe young surgeons all over the world, especially in India, should learn, is to do good to all. He's a Sai Bhakt, and true to what his teachings are, he does only good to everybody. And I have seen that time and time and time again, to do good to all, to have jealousy to none at all. This is what our youngsters must learn. I would like to end up by saying that recently in our hospital in India in Kilpok, we inaugurated five theatres and one of the theatres is called the Professor Vittal or Professor SVL Theatre with a small write-up about him. That's what uh, Raj had to say, sir. Uh, I know Raj uh, for, as he says, more than 40 years, and uh, uh, I'm always very happy. Whenever he has an effort, he has first time he'll go and come back and show me, sir, I got this effort. I got this effort. Four times he has got all the effort is completed. I was very happy. Very, very happy. And um, well, I think uh, when he took to minimal access surgery and bariatric surgery, I used to enjoy his surgery, his lectures, and his multifaceted personality. That is another thing for me. He'll play guitar. He'll write yes, his English poem so nicely. So I always feel that this, uh, God has given him everything. And I am very happy to call Raj Kumar as one of my students. I think you had... Uh... I, we were pleasantly happy to have you in two occasions, at least in uh, Erod, sir, under my tenure as a uh, ASI chairman there once uh, to visit to a hospital yeah. to give a doctor's day speech yeah. and also teacher's teacher award and also other occasion is when I released my first book, first a small book. little book but a small step uh, those days, a handbook of surgery. Now after that with your blessings, we were able to come out with uh, an art and science in endoscopy, pearls of wisdom, manual of advanced endoscopy. Now I'm writing a, a handbook of colonoscopy. So all because of the inspirational forward you gave and also the pat on the back and always you are me, even a distant teacher, because I was not fortunate to 
train under you directly but i was in coimbatore all along but i think i will recollect this what rona is uh, doing and uh, what egalia is doing something like that i usually relate uh, something like that bc roy award patmasri award all those things are re- recognition for your hard work you have done for several decades uh, for the medical and surgical fraternity and this is more recent award of doctor of science from the dr mgr medical university and you are the emeritus professor for this university since then and we as a eags were thinking and uh, how like a thyroid surgery actually is one of our curriculum in our ags also because now we are going into video assisted endoscopy there are people in our uh, association also doing a lot of laparoscopic work abey dalvi dr sivakumar there are a lot of people taking up yeah. uh, endoscopic work in a big way and uh, where you think is the the thyroid surgery or uh, the endocrinology heading and what is the role for minimal access surgeon in the field of endocrine world sir your uh, your vision for the next few years the minimal access surgery has come in as a beginning for instance now today we say the minimal access surgery is the gold standard for uh, adrenal surgery yes sir of less than 6 cm or whatever it may be so that is how we become now you have to know minimal access surgery if you want to do if you want to do that you have to have a basic training of uh, minimal access surgery the same thing video assisted thyroid surgery and endoscopic thyroid surgery all that will have its own day so nobody stays the world is rotating and we are also rotating and we have to go with the world and learn more and more and more and more thing don't be static don't Sorry. ever be static progress is the way of human life so uh, i see a great uh, uh, chance for the minimal access surgery in endocrinology also and i wish you all the best in iags to take it up on a big scale i am blessed with a good family in the sense my wife always helped me right from the beginning when i was going all the time to uk usa singapore malaysia all that you know those days i used to be traveling like that she was very helpful and when i came to this level my son sai krishna has taken over slowly is taking over and he has already taken over and that's a gratifying for me suppose you know uh, he is able to take he is able to do everything he is managing the hospital he is managing everything uh, everybody says and some people come and say sir your son is uh, like you only sir i said why do you want to belittle him i said tell that he is much higher than me <laughs> so i am blessed with a son who is academically very excellent yes sir perfection i may not be that perfect i don't know you may be knowing all that sai vishnu priya yes. is now uh, assistant professor of surgery in madras medical college she has finished her mch and she has got a gold medal also and good. she is also doing very well and she is also good technocrat i used to see operating i used to see sai operating and uh, that is uh, you know you feel very happy yes. though i don't tell them on the face you are done operated very well no i don't do that yeah. that will dampen their interest so today i am opening it out because i am blessed with this family let me hope the god continues to bless this family and all of you and to me also i think it's been very inspiring and educative for all of us to listen to you for so long i think the day is not enough to know all about you and your career i think your life itself is a, i mean the lesson for all of us to get educated and uh, we wish you a happy healthy life and you please continue to inspire us and the surgical fraternity as a whole sir thank you very much sir thank you from iags and our president dr raman goyal and uh, our founder president dr udwadi sir everybody will be very very happy to listen to this interview sir thank you very much thank you very much thank you sir thank, thank you, you. Thank thank you. Thank you. god bless you sir. thank you ishwar sir thank you for uh, bringing out uh, the entire spectrum of uh, contributions from dr vital and uh, it's more testimonials from 
the present day legends in various surgical specialties. It was a lot of learning for all of us. And uh, I also wish uh, Professor Vittal and their family all the very best and uh, with all the peace and success in their career. Ladies and gentlemen, now we move to the second component of the IGS prime time. I could see the enthusiasm in uh, listening to this program. I have more than 20 questions already in the chat box for the anti-reflex procedures. I could see so many people are waiting to listen to Professor Watson. I had the honor of visiting him as early as 2008 to learn anti-reflex operations. And uh, we have the honor of hosting Professor David Watson. He is from Adelaide and uh, he heads the Department of Surgery, the surgical disciplines at uh, Flinders University Hospital, Adelaide. And he currently is the secretary of the International Society for Diseases of Esophagus. And yet another uh, reason to be proud, none other than our vice president, or the president-elect, Professor Sunil Dipapad, is going to moderate the session. And uh, Professor Watson shares his, his experience with more than 4,000 anti-reflex operations. Over to Dr. David Watson, please. Nathan. Okay. Friends, uh, good evening. It is my pride and pleasure to host you for yet another important edition of IAGS Prime Time. Today, we have two important personalities. One, our President-elect, Professor Sunil Papad, who is going to be the moderator for this evening's important uh, pioneer talk from one of the legendary surgeons who has been a forgot uh, legend for the past five decades of his surgical experience. None other than Professor David I. Watson. Professor Watson has dedicated his entire career to the development and perfection training of foregut surgery. And he has a large experience on anti-reflex operations. He had the blessing of getting trained by the world-renowned teachers. And he has been instrumental for the Australia and New Zealand clinical trial group and his boss program contribution are commendable and uh, he has been taught and associated with world renowned forget surgeons. With that, now I request Professor Sunil Papad, our president elect of the IAGS, to formally introduce the speaker for this evening. Professor Sunil, please. Thank you, Dr. Kanagwell. Thank you, IAGS, for inviting me to IAGS Prime. This is a brand new program which has come out in the last few months. On this dais, I'm very pleased to welcome Professor David Watson from Australia. Welcome, sir. Professor Watson is a very senior professor of surgery and head of surgery at Flinders University. He has a very special interest in foregut surgery. And as Dr. Kanagwell said, he has trained many students, many surgeons, and many colleagues like us over the last three to five decades. Forgot surgery has evolved over the last three decades in, in a speciality of its own. And there are surgeons across the world who have developed interest in forgot surgery. Today, we are going to talk about mainly the fundoplication surgery and all of us are aware that over the last five decades, this particular surgery has interested many, many surgeons across the world. As Professor would tell you in his talk, we have all learned our lessons from the knowledge available in the books, from the publications, and from our own experience. And it is very aptly said that a wrongly done fundoplication is much worse than the actual symptoms of GERD. So today we need to learn from Professor Watson how to do foregut surgery in a proper manner so that we and our patients and the community at large gets benefited. IAGS is a 27 year old association of more than 8,000 laparoscopic surgeons of India. 
IAGS has been doing a lot of pioneering fellowship programs over the last 20 years. IAGS has trained more than 3,000 surgeons in its various fellowship programs, such as basic or advanced. Professor Watson, you would be surprised that we are doing advanced laparoscopic surgery fellowship only in upper GI surgery since last couple of years. We are doing advanced laparoscopic surgery fellowships in bariatrics, in upper GI surgery, in colorectal surgery, in hernia surgery, in HPB surgery. And in a year or two, we are starting in oncologic surgery and also robotics. This year, because of the pandemic, everybody got affected. And similarly, the surgeons of India and IAGS also got affected. But under the dynamic leadership of our president, Dr. Raman Goel, we have started a lot of webinars and teaching programs on the digital platform. And I think we have done more than 50 digital programs till now since February onwards. So I'm very pleased and humbled to welcome Professor Watson on this dais. Professor Watson, over to you for your last three decades experience and learning of four good surgery. Thank you very much, sir. Okay. Well, thank, thank you very much, uh, Professor Popat and Dr. Kanagavel, for your very kind introduction. It's um, it's an honour to be able to speak to you and to your um, association in India. Um, unfortunately, because of uh, COVID, um, we're all unable to travel, but um, hopefully uh, sometime in the not too distant future, I can actually travel again and can get to India. So sure. thank you for your introduction. I will try and share my screen. Um, okay. So um, hopefully you can see the screen. Um, I, I was asked to um, talk about um, sort of experience with surgery for reflux and what, what I wanted to do was perhaps um, um, talk about some of the things that we, we've learnt uh, over the last 30 years. Um, my, my experience in terms of laparoscopic fundoplication uh, started in uh, 1992 when I was a, a fellow at the Royal Adelaide Hospital with um, Professor Glenn Jamison and um, I started working with him after they had done some experiments uh, using pigs to try and work out how to do um, anti-reflux surgery or fundoplication laparoscopically. And um, I missed the first three operations. They were done before I started. But um, uh, from, from there on, I was um, uh, involved in the development of, um, of this uh, surgery. Um, so I'm, I bring greetings from Adelaide. This is, uh, this is Adelaide, um, or the centre of Adelaide, which is a... Um, a city in southern Australia and you're all very welcome to come here um, once COVID's finished because unfortunately they've the borders are shut but uh, one day they'll be open again and Adelaide's a really great place to come to especially in the spring and the autumn. Um, surgery for reflux I, I, I think taking this back to the basics um, what, what we're trying to do with um, reflux surgery is to permanently eliminate reflux symptoms, and those symptoms typically are heartburn um, and regurgitation or, or one of those two. There are some other symptoms, but I think the dominant symptoms tend to be heartburn and regurgitation. And at the same time as curing the patient of those symptoms, we don't want to give the patient any new problems. Um, specifically, we want to um, not... Um, leave the uh, patient with um, difficulty swallowing, dysphagia, or flatulence, or an inability to belch, or any other problems. So it's a balance of fixing the problem and not creating new problems. Um, reflux surgery really started uh, properly in uh, 1956. So we we're talking um, sort of 65 years ago when um, Rudolf Nissen described uh, his fundoplication, which is a 360 degree wrap of the stomach around the lower esophagus. Um, but I, I think it was really in 1991 when the first laparoscopic fundoplications were uh, performed that surgery uh, for reflux suddenly became a lot more attractive because no longer did you need to um, 
have your surgery done through an open thoracotomy or a um, upper midline laparotomy, but uh, this surgery could be done through um, four or five small incisions. Uh, recovery was uh, dramatically um, shortened um, and the perception from the patients was that it was a much easier operation to undergo. And in our experience, once um, we'd worked out how to, to do these procedures laparoscopically, the actual demand for the surgery probably went up about 300%, um, which reflects perhaps an untapped demand um, prior to uh, the uh, laparoscopic era. And as, uh, as um, on my title slide in the introduction, what I wanted to talk about was some of our experiences over the last 30 years. So, so we've been going for nearly 29 years, uh, and I did a, a quick look at the number of cases on our database, and it's uh, nearly 3,800 cases when I looked at this about three weeks ago, but we've done another probably six cases since then, and we'll be um, heading to close to 4,000 cases um, next year. Um, our caseload initially in the first um, uh, sort of full year where we were doing things laparoscopically, we did just over 50 cases. But um, by the time we sort of got to about the year um, 1998 onwards, it's been pretty stable at around about 150 cases per year in our unit. So there's a, been, a, as I said, a 300% increase in um, demand. The first procedure that we performed was the Nissen fundoplication, and this was the only procedure that we performed uh, from 1991 to 1996. Uh, but we saw some early problems, and um, uh, some of the early problems that we saw um, in the first few years and recognised, uh, one of them was that we had a, um, a group of patients, probably about 10% of our patients, uh, presented with an acute or early hiatus hernia. Um, what we had been doing is was trying to replicate the surgery we had done as an open surgical procedure, uh, which was a fundoplication, and we would um, selectively repair the hiatus uh, in patients who had a significant hiatus hernia, but we didn't do routine hiatal repair. Um, we we learnt fairly rapidly that uh, this problem could be minimised um, if we always repair the hiatus with sutures, even if there is no hiatus hernia present. Uh, we needed to um, put some restrictions on people working. We had some people that uh, overdid the... Um, physical activity in the first um, few weeks and had acute hernias as a consequence. So we restrict people in terms of no heavy work for about a month. We also identified that most of these acute hernias occur in the immediate post-operative period. Sometimes they even develop in the recovery ward if the patient spends a lot of um, uh, effort straining or coughing or um, when, when they're not um, fully um, awake from the anaesthetic. So we've done a uh, routine barium contrast swallow x-ray on the first post-operative day um, since 1995, um, and that identifies um, occasional uh, asymptomatic hernias, which can be repaired easily uh, in the immediate post-operative period and reduces the risk of the problem. Um, the other early problem we had, and I think this is potentially a technical error, um, but can occur if you get a lot of swelling at the gastroesophageal junction, and that is uh, the patient that can't swallow. And this is a barium contrast X-ray where no contrast is going into the stomach uh, on day one. You actually probably don't need an X-ray to diagnose this because the patient literally can't swallow their saliva. Um, and this is a um, uh, what we found in that particular patient when the patient was taken back to the operating theatre. So here's our esophageal hiatus with the esophagus going through it. There's actually a bit of space there. Uh, but all we did here was cut this single stitch, our top hiatal repair suture, um, check that our fundoplication was loose by lifting it up um, above the, um, uh, the esophagus. And then on the next day, another X-ray done, and you can see the gastroesophageal junction is wide open and the patient can swallow. And the third, third error we um, identified early is what we termed a, a bilobed stomach, which is effectively an obstructed stomach where 
the error here um, occurred from um, um, only having access in some ways to uh, zero degree laparoscopes rather than 30 degree or angled laparoscopes in the early days. And um, we had a couple of patients where the surgeon um, took the body of the stomach rather than the fundus up to create the fundoplication. You can see it creates this two chambered stomach. And in a very extreme case, uh, this particular um, surgeon took the antrum up. So check what piece of stomach you're using if you're making a fundoplication. And this is a patient that's had a um, previous laparoscopic procedure done open, and you can see how the um, the body of the stomach has been used to create the fundoplication, not the um, not the fundus. So we we sort of became. Um, you know, I guess acutely aware, uh, particularly as we were doing more of these procedures, that the Nissen fundoplication is not a perfect operation. You can have problems with recurrent reflux in some individuals, and you can certainly have problems with side effects. Dysphagia is almost uh, inevitable in the early postoperative period, but persists in a small group of people in the longer term. And then we have the additional problem of bloating and flatulence, which are related to not being able to belch and clear gas properly. And I think um, uh, it's the side effects that um, create the problems that um, patients complain about after a Nissen fundoplication. So, so we set out to modify the technique to see if we could actually improve the operation to reduce the risk of side effects and still achieve good reflux control. Um, a number of uh, uh, options were on the table. Um, um, various uh, surgeons uh, had advocated um, shortening the length of a Nissen fundoplication, making it looser, um, really loose and floppy around with a large bougie in the esophagus, uh, dividing the short ga gastric blood vessel. So the North American surgeons strongly advised dividing short gastric blood vessels uh, as a step to ensure that the fundoplication was sufficiently loose. And then the other option was a partial fundoplication, not wrapping the stomach the whole way around the esophagus. And th this really was a um, modification that was advocated by some of the European surgeons um, going back into the 1970s and 1980s. So the question is, uh, how can we best achieve long-term control of reflux symptoms? And how can we minimize the side effects following surgery? And, and is it possible to achieve a perfect outcome for everyone where we have excellent reflux control and no side effects? Now, I think um, it, it sort of depends uh, a bit how you look at the problem, but um, uh, th this, if we consider uh, this to be a picture of some surgeons who are um, up on top of the balcony and looking out on the world. And they have one particular view of the world and of what it looks like and maybe a particular view about how to do surgery for reflux. And then down the bottom, we have another group of surgeons or, you know, I've, I've used this photograph uh, too to um, uh, perhaps uh, highlight the differences between surgeons and gastroenterologists. But uh, another perspective from down down the bottom below the balcony. Um, and both um, the people at the top and the people at the bottom think they understand the world and how things work. But when you put the whole picture together, sometimes it's not quite so simple and um, none of us really get the big picture. We, we see our own perspective and we struggle to, um, to, to, to see all the other perspectives and integrate them. And I think this illustrates why um, when, when we look at what we're doing for reflux, um, we, if we're changing what we do, we need to make valid comparisons between procedures. And to make valid comparisons, I would argue that we need well-constructed, randomised, controlled trials. And in this area of reflux surgery, we do have quite a number of randomized trials from which we can draw conclusions. Um, if we don't um, run with um, evidence from randomized trials, we, we run the risk of, of bias. And um, uh, particularly if you look at um, case series, 
uh, where the outcome has been determined by the by the surgeon, you can actually influence the outcome quite a lot by how you structure the questions and even who asks the questions. So our experience has been that if a surgeon asks a patient whether the operations worked, they will are more likely to say yes than if uh, someone who's um, uh, perceived to be uh, less directly involved, such as a sort of research nurse or even a gastroenterologist, asking the question. Uh, in the context of reflux surgery, um, there have been a number of questions addressed, and I'm not going to look at all of these because I won't have time, but essentially there are uh, numerous trials looking at medical therapy versus surgery, and in general they show that surgery is at least as good as medication, if not better. Um, there have been uh, about a dozen trials of laparoscopic versus open uh, fundoplication. Uh, they almost universally um, support laparoscopic as a better method than open. And there are some studies that have looked at the use of mesh in the context of large hiatus hernia repair, and they're a bit mixed, um, and that's really the topic for another, uh, another talk in another day. But um, I think the mesh question is still controversial. If we're talking about surgery specifically for reflux, and we assume that the patient requires a laparoscopic fundoplication, I think the two big issues are whether or not to divide the short gastric blood vessels during missing fundoplication, or whether or not to um, do a partial fundoplication as opposed to a Nissen fundoplication to reduce the risk of side effects. So with a partial fundoplication, we've got the option of a posterior or toupee type procedure, or we have the option of an anterior procedure, and I'll talk about both of those. So if we look at um, the question of division of the short gastric blood vessels, um, there are six randomised controlled trials which have addressed this question, uh, all in the context of Nissen fundoplication, they're listed there. Um, I would argue that the, um, the the better two are the one that we published from Adelaide where we uh, enrolled 102 patients and we've reported outcomes to 20 years. And the other study from Lars Lundell's group in Sweden where a similar number, just under 100 patients, followed for 10 years. Um, Meta-analyses of these trials basically show equivalent reflux control at anywhere from one to 20 years follow-up. Uh, these meta-analyses also show similar rates of dysphagia. Um, and what uh, I've struggled to explain and even to understand why it should be is that in the larger trials, if the short gastric blood vessels are divided, you actually see more bloating and, uh, and wind type symptoms after the vessels have been divided compared to an equivalent group where they weren't divided. Um, we, we published a um, combined sort of meta-analysis. We basically took the data set from the Swedish trial uh, and our own trial and uh, putting those two trials together, we had 201 patients and we were able to com uh, combine the trials and look at outcomes at um, a mean of 11 and a half years follow-up, so 10 to 12 years. And basically, reflux control was similar, um, 82 and 89% in the two, two groups, not statistically significantly different. But that gives you a bit of a benchmark as to um, how effective these procedures are at 10 years as well, somewhere around roughly about 85% success in terms of reflux control. Um, and these were dysphagia scores. So um, uh, the, the columns on the right are the uh, where the vessels were uh, not divided versus divided, and bas basically the dysphagia scores or the number of people with mild, moderate and severe dysphagia was not significantly different, and there was certainly no trend towards a better outcome if the vessels were divided. Um, the significant issue was the bloating. So if the short gastric blood vessels were divided, 72% of the patients, uh, of the 200 patients, um, reported bloating. If the vessels were not divided, it was 48%. Both groups had high rates of bloating, which is consistent with the Nissen procedure, but it was significantly worse if the short gastric vessels are divided. And we've hypothesized that, that maybe um, we've in some ways denervated the, um, the fundus of the stomach and changed gastric motility in some way by dividing those vessels at the original procedure. 
if we put all these studies together, um, six trials plus a meta-analysis, um, we, we would conclude that dividing the short gastric blood vessels during a missing fundoclication is not necessary. You just need to make the fundoclication short and loose. So how about a partial fundoplication? Well, a posterior partial fundoplication or toupee procedure is what you see on the diagram and also on this photograph here. Um, that can be um, constructed quite easily. There have been 13 trials, some of these in their laparoscopic and some in the open era, 1,300 patients, um, follow-up ranging up to 20 years, most of the follow-up sort of short to medium term, but a lot of trials that have addressed the question as to whether this is a better option than a Nissen fundoplication. Um, and meta-analyses basically show good reflux control for both procedures with no differences. Um, 11 of the 13 trials showed no difference for dysphagia, but um, a lot of these trials were, uh, some of these trials at least were small numbers. That may account for some of that. Um, there was less dysphagia after a posterior fundoplication at two years in a trial reported from Germany, from Zornig. So 8% versus 19%, and also a trial from Koch, another German trial with 100 patients. Um, the consistent finding in these trials was that um, uh, patients were able to belch more easily after a posterior partial fundoplication in most of the large trials, and inability to belch was 8% in the posterior group versus 16% in the Nissen group. So potentially less wind-related side effects after the partial fundoplication. The alternative is an anterior par uh, partial fundoplication, and this original concept was report uh, was um, described by Dor from France, um, and is commonly used after a cardiomyotomy for achalasia as a way of controlling reflux, but not causing dysphagia. So it's an attempt to create a more physiological uh, barrier to reflux. So there are two ways of doing this. One is what we call an anterior 180 degree fundoplication. And in that one, the um, fundus of the stomach is sutured to the esophagus and the right side of the hiatus, the right hiatal pillar. And this other one here, which is a 90 degree partial fundoplication, uh, the fundus is uh, brought to the midline. So it really covers the left anterolateral aspect of the esophagus and there's some bare esophagus between the edge of the fundoplication and the right pillar. Uh, when we do these procedures, essentially we need to dissect the hiatus, uh, which is what you see on these uh, pictures. We need to mobilize the esophagus and create a good retroesophageal window, and then put some sutures in to repair the hiatus posteriorly to um, stabilize the, um, the stomach and the abdomen. And then what we can do is we take the fundus of the stomach and slide it over the front of the esophagus uh, and we take a suture into the stomach and then into the um, esophagus on the side and then the right hiatal pillar. And what that does is sutures uh, or basically stabilizes the um, esophagus and the abdomen uh, and um, accentuates the angle of hiss and creates a flap valve to stop reflux. So this is our um, first suture in place. This is our second suture and third suture. Three sutures holding the fundus of the stomach to the side of the esophagus, the right hiatal pillar. And then some additional sutures in the front to um, close off the potential space in front of the esophagus. And we end up with something that looks a bit like that, where the stomach's just being uh, rotated or folded across the front of the esophagus. So there have been five randomised trials that have looked at uh, this procedure um, of an anterior 180 degree fundoplication. We reported the first one. I'll show you some 20 year outcome data, which was um, presented at a meeting of the International Society of Diseases of the Esophagus last week uh, and is under review from one of the journals. Um, this study from Bob Bagry from Cape Town, a uh, slightly larger group followed for 12 years, a uh, group from China and two small studies from Europe. Um, what the, 
uh, meta-analyses and outcomes of these studies sh basically show is that from a dysphagia perspective, the anterior 180 degree fundoplication is associated with less dysphagia at the one year, five year and 20 year follow-up points. Um, the data at 10 years, which has been reported in two studies, actually didn't show much difference. But uh, the 20 year data we've got does suggest less dysphagia at 20 years. Bloating is consistently less at all follow-up time points between one and 20 years after an anterior 180 fundoplication. Uh, reflux symptom control in the randomized trials was equivalent at one, five, and 10 years, but at 20 years in our most recent study, uh, patients had more reflux symptoms uh, after the partial fundoplication. Uh, equivalent acid exposure measured by pH monitoring at six to 12 months follow-up in, um, in these studies, equivalent surgical revision rates at up to 20 years, so but revision for different reasons. So this, this is some data we actually managed to get from our trial, a small number of patients to um, come back for a fairly detailed uh, set of physiological studies at 14 years after randomization to anterior nissen fundoplication. Unfortunately, this is only 20% of the available patients studied and the sample was biased towards the more symptomatic patients, but um, abnormal reflux in about half the anterior group, but only, um, uh, I think it was about two of the Nissen group. Um, lower esophageal sphincter pressures were comparable, but a little bit less after the anterior fundoplication. Um, at 20 years, um, and, and we've recently um, report, or we're in the process of trying to publish these outcomes, we started with 107 patients in our randomised trial. Um, 15 people died across that 20-year period, which is perhaps not surprising since some people were in their sort of 60s or 70s when they had their original surgery. We had four people that um, could not contribute to follow-up because of uh, dementia or a terminal illness in one patient. And we had 88 patients potentially available for follow-up and were able to determine clinical outcomes in 79, so roughly about 90% of that cohort. And these are the data. Um, we measured heartburn using a 0 to 10 analogue scale. So 0 is no heartburn and 10 is severe heartburn. Um, so the mean score after the anterior 180 at 20 years was 3 versus 1.4 for the Nissen. This was better for the Nissen, less heartburn. PPI medication use, um, I would emphasise that not all patients taking PPIs are taking it for recurrent reflux, but nevertheless there is a difference here of 42% versus 17%, which is significant, and again that is consistent with um, a better level of reflux control at 20 years after a Nissen fundoplication. We look at side effects, this goes the other way. So dysphagia, again, on a zero to 10 analog scale, where zero is no dysphagia and 10 is severe dysphagia. Our mean score is 1.8 for anterior, 3.3 for Nissen, better after the anterior fundoplication. One versus 1.5 for liquid dysphagia, not significantly different. Bloating, 47% versus 61%, but didn't reach significance. Ability to belch, um, better preserved after the anterior fundoplication, 84 versus 66%. That was significantly different. And the, the other um, outcome we measured was um, a global outcome score. So really trying to uh, integrate uh, the reflux control with side effect issue to understand whether from the patient's perspective the operation was worth having done. So we asked the patients, did they think their original decision to have surgery was correct? Would they make the same decision again after the anterior 180? 95% actually said they thought their decision for an operation was correct. It was 85% for the Nissen. That was not significantly different, but you can see here that the poorer reflux control is probably being balanced by the lower rate of side effects to achieve a high rating. And not all people who were taking 
PPIs actually had symptoms. So for many of these patients, the PPIs were effectively controlling their reflux, whereas before their surgery, they, they were not controlling the reflux. So they were, ended up being happy with the overall outcome. The satisfaction score is on a zero to 10 scale again, and this time 10 is the best you can possibly get, and we're 8.4 versus eight. So it was slightly, the trend was again in favor of the anterior, but no significant difference. And this is the surgical revisions at 20 years uh, or across 20 years. So for the anterior fundoplication group, there were six revision procedures, all for reflux. For the Nissen group, there was one uh, for reflux, five for dysphagia and one for hiatus hernia. So basically um, the total reoperations were about the same, but the reason for the reoperations was different. It was uh, dysphagia for the Nissen group and reflux for the partial fundoplication group. Um, this is the study from Bob Bagri, uh, published in uh, the British Journal of Surgery. So they followed 163 patients for 12 years. They uh, achieved 12-year follow-up in 90 patients or 55% of their cohort. They saw no differences for heartburn, dysphagia, bloat or bloating. PPI use was 29% in the partial group versus 8% in the Nissen group. That was similar, uh, so different. The satisfaction rates were similar. So th these are outcomes that are consistent with what we saw in our trial. Now, we, when we finished the uh, recruitment and early data analysis for the anterior 180 degree trial, we hypothesized that um, uh, maybe if we further reduce the uh, extent of the fundoplication, we could further reduce the risk of side effects. So the anterior 180 was still still had some side effects, but not as much as the Nissen. So we proposed this procedure, which we called an anterior 90 degree partial fundoplication. So basically what that involved was suturing the fundus of the stomach to the left side of the esophagus and the left hiatal pillar at the top and then bring, rolling the fundus across and stitching it to the apex of the hiatus and uh, the anterior wall of the esophagus. So covering the left anterolateral aspect of the esophagus. Um, and I won't go into as much detail as with the other procedure, but we did publish um, earlier this year in the British Journal of Surgery, um, a combined data analysis of two randomized trials that we ran. So we ran one trial where the short gastric Vessels were divided during the Nissen procedure and one where they weren't. Um, we had 191 patients in these trials and we had the opportunity to look at follow-up to 10 years. So, again, similar um, scores to, um, and way of following the patients up to what I showed you for the previous trial. Heartburn score was uh, trending higher after the anterior fundoplication group compared to Nissen, didn't quite reach significance. PPI use was higher after the anterior compared to the Nissen, consistent with what we saw in the other trial. Dysphagia scores went the other way, um, so higher after Nissen fundoplication, consistent with the other trial. Uh, painful swallowing, interestingly, was uh, nearly three times higher after Nissen fundoplication. Satisfaction scores were similar. So the, this data is remarkably similar to the other trial that we ran. Um, this slide is an attempt to try and summarise all of the randomised trials that have looked at the question of partial versus Nissen fundoplication. And uh, essentially uh, at sort of follow-up to about 10 years, um, anterior 180 versus Nissen, similar reflux control, same with posterior, a bit worse after the anterior 90. Dysphagia, better after the anterior fundoplication options. Similar, except for two of 13 trials after the posterior fundoplication. Um, flatulence, bloating, inability to belch, all uh, much less of a problem after the partial fundoplications. And overall satisfaction, sort of global outcome measures were similar for all three um, partial fundoplication options versus Nissen. So we 
I guess our preference from this is we think probably the, the balance, if we're going to do a partial fundoplication, is at least in our hands towards the anterior 180 degree procedure. So I guess the question that you could ask after this is whether a perfect outcome is achievable for all patients after a laparoscopic fundoplication. So is there a perfect operation for the treatment of reflux? Um, and I guess what I've shown you is the bottom line is, no, there's not. There are trade-offs. There is um, a risk of recurrent reflux and there is a risk of side effects. And I think you, we can consider these trade-offs as um, going across a spectrum. And if I construct my spectrum with Nissen fundoplication here at the top, going to a posterior partial, then an anterior 180 degree partial, then an anterior 90. As we go from Nissen to anterior 90, the side effects reduce. As we go from anterior 90 to Nissen, our reflux control becomes more secure. So there's a direct trade-off between reflux control and side effects, and they balance. And the question is, where, where does your patient fit in terms of uh, this spectrum, and what, what are the... Um, uh, what are the issues that they prioritise um, when it comes to considering what type of operation to do? So I think um, if the aim of surgery uh, is to maximise control of reflux, but at the same time minimise the risk of side effects, we need to consider that a partial fundoplication provides certainly early advantages in terms of uh, reasonably good reflux control and minimal side effects con compared to the Nissen fundoplication. Um, and it does, I should say, it does actually um, remove from, uh, at least from my practice, some of the uh, quite severe early dysphagias that we used to see with some of the Nissen fundoplication group. Um, this is a graph from a paper we published a, a decade ago now, but it does show across the first two decades of our experience that we started doing a lot of Nissen fundoplications. Then we started in uh, really 1995 uh, to 96, exploring the options of a partial fundoplication, particularly anterior. And as we became more confident with the results, we ended up doing more and more partial fundoplications rather than Nissen fundoplications. And we've got a small cohort down the bottom who have a posterior fundoplication. So put, putting this together, considering this data and, and what we've learned over 30 years, the question is, what do I do? Well, I, I think, and I haven't really gone into how we do the first bit, but these patients need full workup. We need to basically make sure that the problem is reflux. And then we also need to consider, is, is the patient a high-risk patient? When I say high risk, I'm talking high risk, not from a, a uh, medical perspective of comorbidities. I'm talking high risk uh, from the perspective of complaining about the outcome afterwards. So high risk of a poor outcome in our experience tends to be older women or people with atypical symptoms. Um, they really complain about the side effects and um, uh, will uh, keep coming back to see us and wanting more and more things being done. So in the people that I think have a potential high risk of a poor outcome, I want to minimise the risk of side effects. I don't want to give them a new problem. Hopefully I've fixed their, their problem, but if I don't fix their problem because they've got atypical symptoms, then at least I haven't given them a new problem. Lower risk patients tend to be in the younger age group um, men more so than women tend to fit into this group. People with typical reflux symptoms, so heartburn with at least some history of improvement with BPI medication or regurgitation. In these, this group, um, I explain the pros and cons of a Nissen versus a partial fundoplication, and I let the patient make a choice. And if the patient can't make a choice, then I, my bias is towards a partial fundoplication. So what, what do I do from a practical perspective? I routinely repair the hiatus irrespective of what type of fundoplication. On the first post-operative day, as I talked earlier in the talk, I would routinely do a contrast swallow x-ray. 
And if I'm not happy with what I see, I will relook with a laparoscope if I'm concerned. I want to send that patient home knowing that I've correctly constructed the fundoplication and they've left hospital with a well-constructed operation. Um, in terms of fundoplication type, we probably do about 80 to 90% anterior partial fundoplications now and about 10 to 20% Nissen once we work through the selection process. And I'll leave you with this picture from um, south of Adelaide and um, I uh, wish you all well. Thank you. Excellent talk, Professor Watson. I'm very privileged to be your uh, first listener, along with Dr. Kanagwell, to this marvelous lecture. Uh, in the last few slides, you clarified most of the things what you actually do. Now, as I understand, you started with Nissan's and now moved over to doing more and more partial fundoplication and uh, particularly anterior partial fundoplication. Yes. So, just going back to the basics, uh, in your clinic, in your practice, uh, how do you get the patient for reflux surgery? Are they always referred by the physician colleague or some of them land up on uh, your OPD first and then you decide whether to do surgery or not? Um, yeah, so they, they would come from different directions. So we, we would see some patients that come from the physicians, uh, from the gastroenterologists. Um, when we first started doing these procedures laparoscopically, interestingly, um, the view of the gastroenterologists were that um, a lot of patients had problems after a Nissen fundoplication. So patients heard that it could be done laparoscopically and probably about half of our patients came from sort of family doctors, general practitioners. Um, these, these days, um, I, I think... Yeah, it's probably about two thirds come from the gastroenterologist and about one third from the family doctors. I, I do my own endoscopy, so sometimes I will see people that uh, are sort of undifferentiated reflux problem, and I'm quite happy to put them prescribe PPI medication and manage them them, them that way. So I probably prescribe more PPIs than most gastroenterologists as well because of the nature of the practice. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I'm sure that you know, you're doing a lot of research work, so doing a pH and manometry would be part of your routine protocols. Is that across your country or what is the situation? Yeah, so, so um, we, we have good access um, to pH and uh, manometry. So it's not, um, you know, it's, it's not difficult for us to get those tests done. So my routine workup and um, I think you know, probably the routine workup for most surgeons in Australia would be um, esophageal manometry uh, as a minimum. If, if a patient has, um, uh, and, so, and the, re the reason for esophageal manometry is, is that it, it picks up the occasional patient who actually has achalasia. And, that, and I've been surprised by some of the ones that where we pick them up um, I think there are people that you would generally miss if you're not careful. Um, pH studies, I would re we wouldn't always do them. Uh, if someone has uh, typical reflux symptoms, heartburn with some response to PPIs or a history of response to PPIs in the past, and they've got uh, ulcerative esophagitis, so they've got you know endoscopic evidence of reflux, I think that's good enough. They've got reflux. Uh, if if their endoscopy is relatively normal, um, then uh, we would do a pH study to get some objective evidence of, of reflux. If the patient has atypical or sort of unusual symptoms, um, I would um, I would do a pH study because I'm interested in the um, potential correlation between the symptoms and the and the, re the reflux events on that study. Absolutely. In one of your slides, you showed uh, in the comparison between partial and Nissan's fundoplication that uh, acid exposure postoperatively is always more in partial fundoplication. So yep. in your trial patients, would you do PS study preoperatively also to know the, the baseline acid exposure? 
yeah, I did. I didn't show that, but it's in the it's in the papers in the in the journals. Um, so in, in the context of the trials, the, the the baseline exposure was comparable in the in the in the two groups. Um, I think um, the the view we formed is that the Nissan fund application um, effectively provides a, an overcompetent valve. It's a sort of a super competent valve, um, whereas the partial fund applications are aiming to create, if you like, a more physiological valve. And the question for the partial fund application be really becomes, can it um, sort of hold up over a long enough period of time? Um, you know, I, I think you know, what we've shown is there are some trade-offs. The reflux control is not as good over time but we do we do have a significant cohort of patients um, uh, in in the partial fundoplication groups who, before surgery, had reflux symptoms that were not control controllable with medication, have had a partial fundoplication, and some of them have developed further reflux, which is then controllable with PPI medication. So those patients actually tend to um, uh, indicate that they're still happy with the operation because they what their what their aim is is to be symptom free. Yeah, and they are symptom free with a combination of th effectively a combination of therapies. Ideally, you'd like them to be symptom free without any medication, and that is at least still the majority. But the um, the patient's perception around this is actually a little bit different, uh, more nuanced than than perhaps ours is at times. Absolutely. And I think and you mentioned in your slide wonderfully well that uh, find out the high risk patients from the viewpoint of uh, what they want, actually, rather than their actual pathology. Yeah, yeah. So I think, you know, in my mind, I'm trying to work out, you know, is there a group that should be steered in one, one or other direction, in which case I'll tell them this is how I think it should be done. But for a lot of people, I think they do have a choice, and um, uh, for some they will prioritise reflux control, and for some they will prioritise um, minimising side effects, and and that's that's their, that's their choice. And I think you know, we we work with them to um, try and deliver um, what what better fits their aims, knowing that there's going to be a small group of people that um, the outcome's not going to be so good. So we want to. Um, uh, we want that if they do get that not so good outcome, then it's it, it's a bit you know it's the better of two evils if you like. Yeah. Okay. Now talking about revision surgery, professor, when do you decide actually to reoperate on your uh, previous fundoplication patient? Okay. So so I think I, I break this down into. Um, um, it depends on the indication or the reason. So if it's recurrent reflux, um, I guess you know, clearly I want to make sure it is actually recurrent reflux. Not all patients who claim to have further reflux actually have it. So those patients think a full workup. So they will get a pH study, an endoscopy, uh, manometry, and a, and a barium meal X-ray, and um, if they indeed have recurrent reflux, then I would um, insist that they are treated with a PPI first. I'll be careful about do dosing. I'll have them on high dose PPI because a, a revision procedure is not as simple as a, um, a first time round procedure, and the failure rate is higher. So, um, so I'll, I'll maximise the medical therapy first. If they fail on that, um, then then I put an operation on the table and we talk about the, the um, advantages and disadvantages. If the problem is dysphagia, and that's become less of an issue for us because of our bias towards partial fundoplications, but if the problem is uh, dysphagia after Nissen fundoplication, and I do get referred patients who've had a Nissen fundoplication elsewhere, um, um, if, if it's less than 12 months after the original procedure, I just wait. You know, time often helps more than 12 months and if it's if it's troublesome um, my preference these days is actually to use a, a 30 millimeter diameter um, pneumatic balloon the sort you'd use for achalasia 
and do an endoscopic dilatation with a with a large balloon. That probably solves the problem about maybe 70 to 80 percent of the time, in my experience. If you use just the bougie endoscopically, it's it's not good enough. It won't deal with it, but a um, a large balloon often will. If that doesn't work, then then I'm uh, prepared to take them back. And if I take them back for another operation, um, I think you have to uh, be aware there are sort of two potential problems that can cause dysphagia. One might be the fundoplication, in which case convert it to a partial. Um, so that can be converted to a posterior or an anterior. It's actually easier to convert it to a posterior. That's what I tend to do for those. Um, but the other thing I do is I check the um, the um, esophageal hiatus. Uh, sometimes that gets quite scarred and the restriction is actually the hiatus rather than the fundoplication. So put a bougie down there. I'll dissect the anterior hiatus. And if it if it looks tight, then I'll um, divide the um, hiatal rim sort of anterolaterally on the left side and that opens it up a bit, tends to help. That usually resolves the problem. Third problem is hiatus hernia, and uh, set, uh, trying to emphasise early, um, a lot of these I think occur quite early. Um, and so, you know, I'm happy if I see something on day one, they're going back on day one, day two, and we'll fix that up, and that reduces the risk. But there's a small group that will develop a hiatus hernia again, and um, uh, if they haven't got reflux and they haven't got dysphagia, I tend not to do anything. But if they've uh, because they're not really at risk of volvulus or mechanical problems, but if if it's associated with dysphagia or associated with reflux, then we'll fix that up in the same way as I've described. Absolutely. You answered my next question also. I was just going to ask that sometimes post-mission fundoplication, we see patients where they have no reflux, but on endoscopy and on radiology investigation, you would see that uh, there is some paraesophageal hiatal defect. And we tend to leave it alone because patient is not symptomatic. Yeah. And I think you agree to that. Yeah, no, I agree with that. If they're not yeah. symptomatic, leave it alone. Yeah. Now, you already briefly touched upon mesh. Uh, I will simply ask, when do you use mesh in your practice and which mesh? Yeah, okay. So, um, um so, so mesh is a really interesting topic, and um, um, I've um, uh, we, we've published the five-year outcomes from a randomised trial recently in Annals of Surgery, and in that context, we looked at a posteriorly placed mesh. So we we had patients that were at least fifty percent of the stomach was in the chest and the hiatus hernia. So these are really big hernias. We sutured. Re- repaired the hiatus with sutures and we then used an onlay of mesh posteriorly to reinforce that. We used two meshes. Um, one was a non-absorbable lightweight mesh, which uh, the particular brand was called Thai Mesh. But it's essentially a, um, uh, it was a titanium coated, very lightweight um, uh, polypropylene mesh. And the other one was um, Sergi Sis, which was a uh, uh, biological. Uh, biological. Um, wh- what we showed uh, at five years was really no di- no difference in terms of outcome between mesh versus no mesh. Um, very similar results to what the uh, North, the North American um, surgery cyst trial showed. So uh, the North Americans have published a five year outcome. We had a five year outcome and um, relatively high rates of very small hernias one to two centimetres in length, uh, up to 50% in our, in our study. But in terms of significant hernias that cause symptoms required intervention, I think the reoperation rate was about 5% um, across all groups. Um, so we don't use mesh anymore. We uh, have not seen any benefit from it in our trial or uh, indeed any other trial that's reported longer term outcomes. Uh, we're pretty careful to try and preserve the fascial coverings around the um, uh, okay. wide esophageal hiatus because I think if you um, are not careful about preserving that, you can create a defect that's bigger than it needs to be. Um, I do things like um, you can drop the insufflation pressure um, to take tension off as you repair the, the hiatus, but we've not regretted 
um, sticking to a secret approach. If someone does have a problem, it's a relatively simple revision operation. Um, earlier this year, I had a patient who was uh, had an operation done up in Queensland acutely, had a big piece of mesh put in um, and um, re-herniated a... Um, decided to manage the patient after the re-herniation at one week, not by operating, but by putting an esophageal stent in. And then the patient got transferred down to us and couldn't eat anything. Um, long story short, um, the, the revision procedure to try and actually um, deal with that was incredibly difficult. We couldn't get the mesh out posteriorly. We took the mesh out anteriorly. Um, we, she's still got part of her stomach in the chest, but at least she can eat. Yeah. Um, this was a frail, frail woman in her 80s. But um, um, we, we have a, a, a um, group of esophageal surgeons that meet every two years uh, for a meeting. And the final session at our meeting each each uh, time is a um, an opportunity to share your worst case with your colleagues. And there's a <laughs> trophy uh, for the uh, literally the worst case. Yeah. And uh, about a decade ago, I think all of the cases being presented were um, mesh complications leading to esophagectomy. Yeah. So I'm, I'm not a great fan. Absolutely. In our practice in giant paraesophageal hernias, when the defect is more than six, seven centimeters or even eight or 10 centimeters, we are using composite mesh with a gap in the center and gap anteriorly. And touch wood okay. in the, in, uh, in the short uh, follow-up of five years, uh, we have not come across complications yet, but you said it rightly, the longer the follow-up, you would see the complication. Uh, my question is, in a giant paraesophageal hernia, if you are not putting in a mesh, uh, so you would need a, a larger relaxing incision. No. No? No, this, this is where I, I uh, that, that's the uh, Stephen Demista approach. Um, and I, um, I think, um, I, I think if you're really careful to, you know, I, I, we, we aim to keep our dissection sort of about a centimetre uh, inside the sac, so that um, you you always have good good coverings of the um, hiatal pillars, and you know, we're, we're we're operating on. You know, 30 or 40 intrathoracic stomachs a year. So this is not an uncommon procedure for us. Um, we, we just start suturing posteriorly. And if it in many of the patients, it just comes together without much of a problem. Yeah. If, 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 if we see tension, um, what? Um, so we're using a Nathanson liver retractor, which provides a degree of abdominal wall lift at the same time. So we can drop our gas pressure down to six or eight millimetres of mercury and so I, I tend to, if I start seeing any tension, I just start dropping the pressure. Once you get down to six to eight millimetres of mercury pressure, generally it comes together pretty well. Occasionally it doesn't. And then um, the hiatus takes almost a triangular configuration. And I put some sutures sort of anterolaterally on the left side. And I come at it from another direction to repair it. Um, and... Um, I, I'm happy to accept that um, I might get um, a small recurrent hernia. If I get a recurrent hernia of one to two centimetres in size and the primary indication for the operation was uh, sort of rotation, volvulus twisting in the stomach, that stomach's not going to twist. So I've actually solved that problem. Um, yeah. But, yeah, I, I'm, we've... We, we've just not been happy with mesh complications, and I, I guess I'm. Uh, my, my thought is, if um, something goes wrong, I'm, I'm thinking about what the next operation is going to be. Yeah, yeah. So it's better to be aware of the dangerous complications of surgery. That's wonderful. Now this is a vast topic, and we can go on discussing for hours, Professor. We like sure. your uh, experience and your training. Uh, this is a complex surgery in upper GI, in foregut surgeries. And many of your recurrences or redos you would be doing uh, may be coming from the junior colleagues who are enthusiastically doing a very tight fundoplication. So how to treat junior surgeons properly in this? What are, what are your uh, guidance? What is your guidance regarding training? 
yeah, okay. Um, so um, this, this may be where I think we're, where our training environment is perhaps a little bit different to some other countries. And uh, I think... Um, you know, I think we're quite quite different to perhaps the situation in the United States where um, there's a lot of people doing small numbers of fund applications. Um, uh, for, for us, this has really become a um, subspecialty operation. So um, uh, before laparoscopic surgery, every general surgeon would have might have done three or four of these operations a year. When we started doing them laparoscopically, it seemed they all started coming to um, the, the groups that were doing it laparoscopically, and they were largely within the larger sort of university teaching hospitals. Um, so um, I, I, I think for us now, we, we've got fairly well-established training pathways. So um, um, surgeons doing this work now, our junior colleagues will, will have done a two-year upper GI fellowship and um, will have um, been ex you know, exposed to maybe sort of you know, 30, 40, 50 of these operations they would have done personally during that training. So we think we have sort of can get them over those learning curve issues and, and deal with that. And Generally, they they are working in hospitals where they're working in groups with senior colleagues as well to be supported. So, um, yeah. Um, so, so I, I I think that's that's probably where we've been lucky, and we've been able to um, maintain that. And um, we've we've also you know even within my my own state. Um, uh, it's probably a sort of small enough environment, well, small enough in population, not small enough in geography, but small enough um, to actually know, know, know people and uh, people will speak to each other and, and share their problems and, and work through things. But it would be yeah. unusual for someone to finish general surgical training and then try and do one of these procedures. They, they would go through a, a fellowship program now. Yeah. Now, sir, would you be advising your uh, junior colleagues to use a bougie of some size in their first 30, 40 surgeries or first one or two years yeah. of practice? Yeah. So um, so for a Nissen fund application, I would still use a bougie to, ca uh, to calibrate that wrap. Um, I, um, I have colleagues uh, on my unit that would use a bougie for a partial fund application to calibrate that the closure of the um, hiatus. Um, I don't use a bougie. I have another colleague that measures it. He will get a grasping instrument, open the jaws and, and, and measure it out. He has a, he's aiming for 2.5 centimetres. Um, I, I, think, I think you need to do something to, to make sure that you don't make it too tight. Um, so with, a, with, a Nissan, with a Nissan, I think the, the you know, I would definitely use a bougie for that. Um, as a way of ensuring that with a partial, you can get away without it, but I, I think you just need to have some other strategy to make sure you don't make it too tight. Bougie, too bougie of 56 or a simple or um, gastric tube or which uh, one would you use? The, the one in our theatre is a 52 French bougie, but um, I, I don't think it matters too much whether it's 50, 52, 56 or even 60. I think you just need to... Um, have it, I think they all get it roughly the same same size. Yeah, I, I tell our trainees that they need to make it look about the same size as a twenty cent piece. So an Australian twenty cent coin is the perfect size for. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in our experience, <clears throat> excuse me. In our experience, we have seen some of our patients post Nissan fund application in their earlier post operative period, six months to twelve months. They develop frequency of stools. So, have you come across such a symptom? Yeah, yeah, no, I've I've seen that. So, um, I, I I've always assumed that's due to damage to the vagus nerves. Um, so, I think um, potentially, um, I think we see it more commonly after the really big hiatus hernia, the intrathoracic stomach. So, I think it's incredibly difficult to identify and protect the posterior vagus nerve and the anterior vagus nerve can be damaged as well. So I've 
certainly seen uh, a small number of people who've had quite severe diarrhea in the early period. Um, it, um, I've managed them with um, uh, things like a low pyramide to try and slow down the um, uh, the, the uh, bowel actions for a while, and it, it generally, once they get past about six to twelve months, it seems to stop. So I think it's. That, um, yeah, I yes, think it sir. does get. Better. Um, what I was thinking was, if we injure the vagus, the motility would be reduced rather than increased. So I couldn't explain why it was happening. Well, you get this sort of post vagotomy diarrhea, which is sort of almost like a dumping phenomenon, and I think. Um, I, I specifically warn people after the big hernias, I tell them they might be constipated, they might get diarrhea. I'm not yeah. sure which one you get. Um, um, there, there is, um, you know, I, we, we see this a bit. I, you know, because I treat esophageal cancer, we divide the vagus nerve quite a bit. Um, so we do see it sometimes after esophagectomy. Uh, I think it probably is a dumping phenomenon. Um, what we do see, though, is um, after vagotomy, over time, you get um, sort of recovery of um, or rebalancing, if you like, of intrinsic nerve function in the gut. So by the time you get to um, sort of um, one and a half to two and a half years, um, things like gastric emptying after vagotomy largely recovers. But I, I, you know, my experience is that the diarrhea issue tends to be after big hernias or re revision surgery where the vagus nerve is at risk. Yes, sir. And it does, and it does recover. Right. So. Yeah, it's always uh, self-limiting. That's what we have observed. Yeah. Now, last question, sir, before we finish, is regarding gastric bypass. In your uh, redo cases, uh, when do you advise gastric bypass? Recurrent reflexes. Yeah, yeah no, it's, it's a really good question. Um, so, so I think... Um, uh, yeah, it's, it's a good question. I've also seen people get really offended when uh, um, I've had a couple of people come to me because a colleague has told them they should have a gastric bypass, um, and they got quite offended by that. Um, so, so, so I think um, so. Obviously, a, a gastric bypass is actually quite a good anti-reflux operation because you've um, diverted all of the bile and, and almost all of the acid away from the um, esophagus. So it's, um, in many ways, it's, a, it's actually a more reliable anti-reflux operation than a fundoplication. Um, so I think if someone's had one failed operation and they're not obese, I would happily, um, I wouldn't even talk about a gastric bypass. If they've had a failed operation and, and they are actually um, you know, morbidly obese and they meet the requirements for um, gastric bypass, I, I think you do need to um, at least put it on the table as an option for them to consider. I wouldn't twist their arm. I think it's up to the individual as to, to what they want. Um, and I've seen people that would want to go that way and some that wouldn't. So... If they've had um, multiple previous operations, so if they've had um, two, two failed fundoplications or you know, three failed fundoplications, um, I, I would be you know, effectively gastric bypasses, the old um, antrectomy and ruin Y procedure, which was described for that scenario. So I'd be more likely you know, to put that on the table. I'd just be concerned if the patient was not overweight um, I don't think I'd be putting that one on the necessarily on the table. Yeah, but um, yeah, it, ne it needs certainly needs to be considered, and it's part of the um, the toolkit for for dealing with reflux. Right. Thank you very much, Professor Watson, for wonderful learning experience we had with you, and we certainly hope that in future, in many of our fellowship programs and forthcoming conferences, we'd like you to have in person here in India with us. And thank you so much for this wonderful lecture and opportunity to discuss with you some of the questions and queries we are having. Thank you. Over to Dr. Kanagar. Okay, thank you. Pleasure. Uh, thank you, Professor Watson. Thank you, Professor Sunil Papad, sir, for uh, the wonderful session. I think, uh, as you rightly said, this is a 
a day long or a couple of days long uh, procedure where we need to deliberate a lot and it's been a lot of learning thank you uh, iags for giving this opportunity for me to host both of the senior faculty here for our iags prime uh, we look forward to meet you in one another session thank you thank you sir thank you okay dr raman goel please Uh, thank you, Dr. Sunil. Uh, thank you, Dr. Watson, for uh, making such a long uh, list of questions covered up, and uh, almost we got answered most of the important issues. I now take the privilege of inviting the president to give his comments before we close. I think, Dr. Kanagwe, you need to take the questions also. I know I see so many of them are pending. Mm -hmm. So before you take the questions, thanks for inviting me to speak a few words. I think it had been a, a wonderful evening and a pleasure to listen to Professor Vittal initially being interviewed by our Honorary Secretary, Dr. Ishwamurthy. Professor Vittal is a, a pioneer, a legend in his own rights across the country. And it had been a privilege, my privilege to meet him personally somewhere, I think, in 2003 and 4, when I was invited for the National Conference of Internet, uh, Indian Association of Endocrine Surgery. And uh, uh, Dr. Sai Vittal was also there in Chennai. And uh, that is the time when they discussed including bariatric surgery as part of the endocrine surgery. I think that's an ongoing discussion. But it's amazing how he has molded lives of so many of people uh, across the country. And that is what uh, we had envisaged that uh, IAGS Prime will bring the legends of surgery uh, across the country. You know, it's not about legends of IAGS. It's legends of uh, surgery who have been, uh, who have contributed in teaching and developing the, the philosophy of surgery in this country. And Professor Vittal definitely belongs to that, that class. And uh, it's an honor for IAGS to have him uh, participate in this. And I think, thank Dr. Isha Murthy for organizing and conducting this uh, talk so beautifully. Friend, this talk will be available on the YouTube forever, and I hope that many more surgeons who have not been able to join today would be uh, would take benefit of that. The second part of the IAGS Prime today uh, with the Professor Watson was amazing because uh, I had been doing uh, fund applications for more than 25 years before I stopped doing them uh, because I chose to do lap bariatric. But I still do it as part of bariatric surgery in many patients because all, almost about 30% of our patients do end up with reflux disease and we need to do a, a repair in those patients. And what he has spoken today was uh, is what we need to accept that there are no black and whites in surgery. In many conferences across the country, young surgeons ask, why don't we give a definite answer to them? Why don't we give one or two, three? And what Professor Watson has shown today, uh, for, a, for a procedure for fundoplia for, uh, for reflux disease, that you, you always have a trade-off. You have a trade-off better results and more side effects. You have a, have a trade-off inferior results and less side effects. So I think... Uh, these gray zones are part of surgery and they are never going to go away. And as the society, as a surgeon, we all need to grow and we all need to accept them. I find these questions asked repeatedly in bariatric surgery to me now, as they were asked earlier for general surgery for, to me. And it's very difficult to say that, but what Dr. Watson has shown is, is amazing because it's evidence based. He has shown where. The, Partial anterior repair uh, worked better in long term as far as side effects are concerned, but had inferior uh, results in terms of reflux. So I think uh, Dr. Sunil Popat, who is going to be the president very soon in the next three to four months, who is going to occupy the chair that I am sitting on today, has done a wonderful job by asking such, uh, such pertinent questions and bringing out the best out of Professor Watson. So thank you, Sunil, for, uh, for taking this responsibility. And I again thank Prof. Dr. Kanagwil for conceptualizing this idea and conducting this meeting every fortnight. 
I, I know there are many questions. I can keep on talking as everybody is saying for one or two days only on reflux disease. But I leave it to Dr. Kanagwell to take your questions and to get their answers. Dr. Kanagwell, please. Thank you, President, sir. Uh, in fact, um, it's uh, 3 o'clock in the morning in Adelaide. So uh, I would say, please mail us your questions. Uh, Professor Watson has agreed to uh, get back with all the answers. So with that few words, I thank for the opportunity given by the IAGS. I thank the President, Secretary, and the entire EC for allowing me to conceptualize and do this program fortnight after fortnight. Now, I formally invite uh, uh, our Honorary Secretary, uh, Dr. Ishwar Murthy, sir, to propose the vote of thanks. Over to you, Dr. Ishwar, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President, friends, and ladies and gentlemen. I think it is a very interesting blockbuster event and edition from my our hero of today, Dr. Kanakville. Well done, you have done uh, laurels to our uh, association. And on a festive weekend, I am sure, with the uh, blessings of our Lord here, the Durga and also Saraswati, I think it symbolizes the knowledge and power, as you can see, the triumph of this event and celebrating the triumph of the good over evil. I think the tone is set for this very important black person. Both the events were so wonderful. The one taken hour long by our president-elect Sunil Papad, uh, really choreography. I think we say the big structure, the way the clarity of the message from David Watson across the other continent for the nearly an hour is amazing. I think his pearls of wisdom after 4,000 plus surgery is amazing. I'm waiting to hear all the interactions going to happen. I think we need to allow them to watch this site in the next few days to see all the chat box filled with all the questions and answers from them. And well done, Kanakwil, for coordinating this event. And of course, my time, actually, it was a real moving time for me uh, as an interviewer to talk to uh, Professor Vichal and his family. I think that I have to thank the family for the time and efforts because they uh, gave, gave me a lot of pictures and uh, all the things and i brought those four students only to set the storyline how inspiratory and how stimulating to see a giant and how he is acknowledging all the good so that's the thing we wanted to hear more and more in our forum and we also recognized a lot of our IHS members also being a part in various things. And before I go, I need to thank our the team, Indo-UK Sajikan, and all the people out there who were delegates, 2,000 plus delegates who joined. Please watch me in this platform to reveal you the time and venue of our next big even a grand event, the IHS 2021 at Time Two. While you are waiting, I request all of you to take the online fellowship courses. Wait for your convocation. FIH is online, EFH is online. Now, with a four cut person, David Watson speaking, we are having actually just four days to go to open our false upper GI online. So please join in a big number and patronize, and I'm sure your knowledge is power. And uh, today is auspices day, which is Dasami day tomorrow. I think all of you please register for this. And once again, Docs Pluses, thank you, Kritika. Thank you, Surveys, Nick, the whole team. Wonderful job yet again. And full mark to Kanagavel and our president. Thank you all. Bye-bye now.